everyone. So it's been a good spell, but I am back with a really new series about one of my favorite topics, world language families. So if you don't know anything about world language families or really what they are, um, I'm going to do a multi-part series diving into the world's language families, their most interesting aspects, and of course, where they're spoken, which languages are in them. And we're really going to get to understand this world on a linguistic scale. So in this first episode, I wanted to start with the biggest and the baddest language family. So we're going to start with the world's most geographically widespread language family, Indo-European languages. Cleo, pritos es mi jos kod voitas tetuash. Nu quisquidois od gal galiesi teutore. You can find them natively spoken as far as Iceland and Pakistan, or Portugal and Bangladesh, or even Nepal and Finland. It's just this massive. Indo-European branch, and of course they're also spoken in the Americas because of colonization. So we're going to dissect this really, really big family into its smaller components and understand how this family, this very unique family, came to be. So to start off with this family, we're going to start with a lot of the European branches. And if you don't know, a branch is essentially a smaller uh, subgroup of a language family. So in this case, we have Indo-European languages, and we'll first start talking about Germanic languages. So this branch of Indo-European Germanic was originally spoken around 500 BC, and over time, these branches diverged even more into the languages we have today, such as Danish, Icelandic, Swedish, Norwegian, and even Faroese in the North Germanic branch, and Dutch, German, Afrikaans even, and English in the West Germanic branch. And of course, there was a formerly spoken East Germanic branch with the Gothic language, but that died a while ago. So we'll look at the West and North Germanic languages for just a second. Interestingly enough, the North Germanic branch is actually a group of somewhat mutually intelligible languages. Contrary to West Germanic languages like English, German, and Dutch, where they're not fully mutually intelligible, with North Germanic languages, it's often a lot easier to understand within their subdivided groups. So Icelandic and Faroese are rather mutually intelligible, and Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian are often mutually intelligible, especially within writing because of pronunciation differences. I've always found that one of the most interesting North Germanic languages was Faroese that I've mentioned. Because it's closely related to Icelandic, even though it's geographically closer to Scotland and the British Isles, Faroese makes this interesting and unique blend of Germanic languages, and when you trace back its origins, you can really tell how close it is to something like English or German, or of course Icelandic. And I've always found this Faroese language to be a very interesting linguistic case. So there you have it for Germanic languages, spoken a lot in Western Europe, Scandinavia, and Germanic languages are actually the most widely spoken second languages, mainly because of English, of course. So we can now remain in Western Europe and look into the Romance languages. Equidem nullum aliud concilium nisi mali vestri impediendi di neo. Ile che tanta beneficia dederat iaboxissus es. So you might have heard about the Romance languages, the main ones being French, Italian, Spanish, and even Romanian, and of course Portuguese. And these languages are often ones that people love learning as a second language or even in school. Romance languages are some of the most geographically widespread languages because Spanish and Portuguese are spoken in Latin America, you have French in West Africa, and this just constitutes for a large portion of the world's speakers. Most of us know really what Romance languages are these days, but it's interesting to trace their origins. So these Romance languages all diverged from Latin. As the Roman Empire spread, the Latin language would spread as well, but because they didn't have things like the internet that we have today, the Latin language started to diverge from region to region. And as these countries began to split off as the Roman Empire started to fall, these languages would arise as their own dialects and even become their own languages that we have today. French, for example, was influenced by the Celtic languages that were spoken in the French region and became its own unique language, similar cases with Spanish and things like this that led to the separation of Latin into new languages. And a very interesting case in this scenario is the Romanian language, which is spoken in Romania and Moldova, 
And this language is oddly separated by a lot of Slavic languages. It's this little pocket of Romance language in Eastern Europe as a result of the Roman Empire falling and a Latin language being continued in use in Eastern Europe. Even before Latin was spoken, there were proto-languages or languages that have been reconstructed through linguistic anthropology. And this main language was known as Italo-Dalmatian. The Italo-Dalmatian branch was the first one to diverge from Indo-European and become these languages that we know today, such as Latin. But in reality, Latin was really the main branch that survived through all these years in the form of these languages. So we have a very unique case of Romance languages. And when you look at them, you can notice a lot of similarities in grammar and vocabulary with Germanic languages, mainly because of the extent of the Roman Empire, but also because they diverged from that same family. Similarly in Europe, we have our third major branch, which is the Slavic languages. Corl est, te baise d'atteinte, se nous moyego rodina hodion. So the Slavic languages constitute the vast majority of regions in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, as well as parts of Central Europe, and of course Siberia, where it's spoken in Russia. So these Slavic languages can be easily traced back to Old Church Slavonic, which was a language that was used for liturgical purposes in Slavic Europe. And over time, again, because of this widespread expansion of Slavic peoples, this Old Church Slavonic language diverged into multiple languages. And nowadays you can trace these and group them into about three separate groups. One of these families is called the West Slavic languages, which mainly constitutes Czech, Polish, and Slovak, but it also has a unique minority language called Sorbian spoken in Germany. These languages, when written, are often very mutually intelligible, especially Czech and Slovak, because even until the 90s, they were considered one macro language. But of course, they have their differences. They are different enough to be considered different languages, and Polish itself was influenced a lot by Old Church Slavonic preserving nasal sounds like a uh and e, uh, which a lot of other Slavic languages don't have. Nie było do pojedynku o 100 tysięcy złotych. Jedna zła odpowiedź. Jesteś zmuszony pociągnąć za spust. And another branch of the Slavic languages that diverged was the East Slavic languages. This constitutes Belarusian, Ukrainian, and of course, Russian, which is principally the most widely spoken Slavic language, being spoken all the way from areas bordering one mile away from Alaska in the United States to regions of Eastern Europe like Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus, where it's often spoken natively or as a lingua franca, a language used for trade and inter-ethnic communication. So Belarusian, Russian, Ukrainian, and even a language called Rusin, which is spoken in the Carpathians in Slovakia, these are all these Eastern European languages that are mutually intelligible to some extent, but still, again, enough to be considered different languages, and they have diverged a lot in recent history. And oftentimes, of course, these East Slavic languages are written using the Cyrillic script, which actually originated from a South Slavic language called Bulgarian. So we'll talk about South Slavic languages now. Languages in this branch include Bulgarian, Macedonian, Serbo-Croatian and Slovenian. And interestingly enough, a lot of these languages are contested to be dialects of one another, such as Serbian and Croatian, Macedonian and Bulgarian, or even Bosnian and Serbian, or Montenegrin and Serbian, or Montenegrin and Bosnian. So it's a very confusing mess, but all that really matters is that they are South Slavic languages, and a lot of them are extremely mutually intelligible, enough to just be considered dialects of one another. Nevertheless, these Slavic languages are very rich in history, and they have developed into something that is very unique in Eastern Europe, and of course other regions, and I've always been particularly fascinated by them and how similar yet different they really are. And one thing I didn't fully mention about the Slavic languages is that they didn't just diverge from Old Church Slavonic, but rather from a Proto-Balto-Slavic language, which diverged into the Slavic languages and the Baltic languages, which I'll talk about now. So the Baltic languages is a small group of languages that is spoken in the Baltic region of Northern Europe, and principally, the main languages of this branch are Latvian and Lithuanian, 
two languages which diverged quite a while ago, so they're not extremely mutually intelligible. But these languages are quite interesting because not only do they preserve things that are common features in Slavic languages, but they are also one of the first branches to break off from Indo-European, possibly constituting them as some of the oldest languages in the world still spoken today. Baltic languages used to be extremely widespread throughout Central Europe, mainly through the language Prussian that we all know from the Prussian Empire that used to control most of Germany, but have since receded into their humble abode of Latvia, Lithuania, and even parts of Estonia. So, so far we have three major branches of Indo-European, Romance, Germanic, and Slavic. And oddly enough, we have barely even scratched the surface of this Indo-European branch. Even in Europe, we have another family or branch called Celtic. And these Celtic languages are quite interesting in their own right because they're spoken not only in the British Isles, but they used to be spoken throughout all of Europe and they may be even theorized that they were spoken as far as Anatolia. Ois equusque, som trumum wegnum ducontam, som gidonium rinnum berentam. So these Celtic languages, another separate branch of the Indo-European family, are mainly spoken in the British Isles, like I said, with Scottish Gaelic, Welsh, and Irish being the most widely known ones. But there are also many smaller ones that are still spoken or recently endangered to this day, such as Breton in the west coast of France, Cornish on the southern part of the British Isles, and languages like Manx on the Isle of Man. And this makes the Celtic language family very interesting. So this branch itself can also be subdivided into different branches. Scottish Gaelic actually came from Irish Gaelic many thousands of years ago, but it's also distantly related to Welsh, and Welsh is distantly related to Manx, and Manx is distantly related to Cornish, and Cornish is distantly related to the Breton language in France. The Celtic languages just make this unique web of mutual intelligibility, and while most of them aren't mutually intelligible, you can't really understand one and another language, they can really be understood when you look at their writing or you try to deeply look at the roots that may be similar. And unfortunately, for the most part, these Celtic languages, which are rich in their own grammar and word order, are generally endangered. Uh, Irish is being replaced by English, same with Scottish uh, being replaced by English and Scots. Uh, which is either a dialect or a language of English, and it's very interesting as well. And then there's also uh, Breton, which is being replaced by French. So the Celtic languages, although very interesting and once very important in Europe, have essentially receded into these small pockets of the British Isles where they are being endangered on a day-to-day -day basis. But fortunately, there are many attempts to revive these languages in their respective communities, which is good news for Celtic speakers. John has not yet run out of stories. In Eurasia, there are also a couple separate branches of the Indo-European family that aren't necessarily related or categorized in these subgroups. One of these branches, the Hellenic branch, is where Greek is spoken, and these languages once used to be spoken throughout all of the Mediterranean, but have now, of course, receded to Greece and the Black Sea region. You can find many sub-dialects of this Hellenic branch, such as Greek itself, but there's also the ancient Spartan language spoken in a village in southern Greece, and also the Pontic dialect or language that's spoken, of course, in northern Greece, in the Turkish Black Sea coast, and even in Armenia which I got to interview one of the last speakers in that country. And that was really interesting. Tati, asma pare. Pare, pare, pare privet. Kalimera. Kalimera. Che, la una stan in la Kalimera, Grecia in. Ki. Ah, voce. Ah, par Grecia. Ti canis. Ti canis in che fanno. Ah. Armianca, in che fanno, ti canis. In addition to the Hellenic branch with Greek, 
There's also Albanian, and Albanian is spoken right above Greece in Albania and Kosovo, which is either a country or a southern region of Serbia, depending on who you are. And it's also spoken in parts of Italy, Greece, and throughout the world in its uh, diaspora. And one of the last and particularly interesting ones is Armenian. Armenian is spoken in the country, the modern state of Armenia, but it also used to be spoken in Turkey, and it has two of its own major dialects, West and East Armenian. West being spoken mostly by the international community, and East being spoken within Armenia by its people. And within the Indo-European family, Armenian might be considered an isolate group, although it does share a lot of grammatical similarities to the Indo-Iranian branches of the family, which we'll talk about right now. Yas yas urna nast, achwans dadarcha, tamgurum, wajham, wajhantam. So that was all part of Europe, but interestingly enough, the vast majority of speakers of Indo-European languages are actually located in Asia, particularly the Middle East and South Asia. This main group of languages spoken in South Asia and uh, Iran, of course, is the Indo-Iranian branch. So within this Indo-Iranian group, we have many unique and very widespread geographic locations as to where they're spoken. From the Farsi slash Persian language spoken in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, to the Bengali language spoken in West India and Bangladesh, there's so much diversity in this branch of languages that it essentially constitutes its own different thing. And within this branch, of course, grammar is very similar, pronunciation is very similar, and even basic numbers like 0 to 10 are very predictable. Some very unique instances of Indo-Iranian languages are the Ossetian language, which is spoken near Georgia and in Georgia, and also in the North Ossetian district of Russia. And then there's also the Singhala language, which is spoken as the principal language in Sri Lanka, way down in South India. And then there's also Nepali, the national language of Nepal, spoken by the majority of its citizens. And of course, there's also Pashto, which is spoken in Afghanistan alongside Persian slash Farsi. And there are many more Indo-Iranian languages that are extremely widespread throughout Asia, such as Kurdish, the largest ethnicity without its own state, and Oriya, which is spoken in West India in the state of Odia. And then there are also many minority languages, these small pockets of Indo-Iranian languages spoken throughout Asia, even as far as China. So there you have it, that is the Indo-European branch, one of the most fascinating and widespread language families on this planet. And I don't know about you, but talking about languages and learning about families always gets me really excited. And it's actually the reason why I started my series Indigenous to look for the most endangered and lost languages around our planet. And even some of the languages I mentioned in this video, such as Pontic Greek, have been languages that I've looked for. So if you're interested in languages and their history, I'm pretty sure that you'll be really interested by this series and by my channel as a whole. And I can't wait to teach you more about the languages of our world, but also to show you the stories behind the speakers of these lost languages around the world. So I'll see you guys in part two, where we're gonna be exploring a bit of the Middle East and African families.